Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar, Closing the Financing Gap, Investing in Natural Capital to Achieve the SDGs. My name is John Mon, and I'm the Research Program Manager here at GGKP. By coming here today, you've already demonstrated how much you value nature. Thank you for joining us and I congratulate you on your commitment. However, we don't find often enough that our economic systems value nature as much as we do. And so we scramble often years after the fact to halt and reverse the damage we have done. We can do better. We are fortunate that governments around the world have already made commitments in this direction. We call them the Sustainable Development Goals, and many of the SDGs fundamentally depend on our ability to thrive with nature. Today, we'll hear what it will take to get us back on track for 2030. Our esteemed panel will be focusing on solutions. How do we get the finances flowing in the right direction? We want you to be a part of this conversation. During the webinar, feel free to send us your comments or your questions using the chat function. Afterwards, join us on the Green Forum where the discussion will continue. The Green Forum is an online interactive space where you can engage and share your perspectives. You can find it at thegreenforum.org. Also, you can stay tuned by joining the more than 14,000 experts and peers who are subscribed to our newsletter at ggkp.org forward slash subscribe. After the webinar, we'd appreciate it if you could take just a few minutes to complete a short survey so that you can help shape our future events. Today's presentations, as well as a full recording of the webinar, will be available afterwards at ggkp.org. Finally, for those of you who are new to GGKP, the Green Growth Knowledge Partnership, let me say that we are a global network of 75 organizations and thousands of experts from the policy, business, and finance communities, all committed to working together to support a green economy transition. We do this at GGKP through three knowledge platforms, the green policy platform, the green finance platform, and the green industry platform. Today's session is brought to you by GGKP's research program. And the research program works with our partners to collaboratively generate and apply green growth knowledge and decision-making. We do want to thank the MAVA Foundation for Nature for making today's event possible. With that, it's now my great pleasure to introduce to you the moderator for today's event, Megan Rowling. She is climate correspondent for Thomson Reuters Foundation. She has covered many of the issues we hear about today for more than 20 years, having worked for Reuters Broadcast, the BBC, and a range of newspapers and magazines. Megan, I'm delighted to welcome you to today's webinar, and I turn it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, John, for the kind introduction, and welcome to everybody today. And thank you to our speakers for joining, and to GGKP for hosting this event. Um, as John mentioned, um, there's a lot more news stories these days uh, that are looking at the gravity and the reality of the environmental challenges that the planet is facing um, as a result of what um, we humans um, have done to its natural resources. And I think as a journalist, um, from what I'm seeing and from what I'm hearing, um, since the COVID pandemic hit uh, early last year, this is just becoming more and more urgent uh, and we are hearing a great deal more about the harm and the damage um, that uh, we are doing both to ourselves and to uh, the plants, animals and ecosystems, um, which is so vital for us to survive. Um, and also we are learning more about the interlinkages um, between those things and it's clear that we can no longer continue to fail to measure the cost of the depreciation of nature um, and the dangers that runaway climate change and biodiversity loss will bring. 
um, if we do not do something about it. Uh, also, we had the Desgupta review, which was uh, a big jolt, uh, I think, to, to the economic world as well, um, arguing that it really is time that we put a value um, on natural capital and the services that ecosystems provide to us and that whereas domestic product and other orthodox measures of economic value do not do that um, in, a, in an effective and efficient way. Um, so now that we have the COVID-19 recovery packages um, well underway and being, being planned and developed, um, and also we have the prospect of the new global framework uh, on biodiversity, which is due to be agreed later on this year under the CBD COP15, uh, um, as well as the COP26 climate change conference coming up in November in Glasgow. It's clearly a defining year for the biosphere um, and everything that exists within it. And in order to ensure that it is far better protected, um, there is a huge need to mobilise finance to plug the gaps in um, the economic and environmental solutions. And for that, we need to have both the public and the private sector on board. And that is going to be the subject that this event today will address. So, first of all, um, we're going to have a presentation um, uh, on a new report launch, uh, which is around the 770 billion year a year investment gap that needs to be plugged uh, to meet the natural capital related SDGs by 2030. Then we will have a response to that presentation and then uh, we will have a 30 minute panel discussion and then we will turn it over to questions um, from the audience and answers from our panelists. So I will just first introduce our speakers, um, not in the order that they're going to speak, uh, but uh, starting with Yanez Kotoshnik, who is the former European Commissioner for the Environment. He is now co-chair of the International Resource Panel and a partner at the consultancy Systemic. Then uh, we have our three panelists who are Elizabeth White. She's Principal Strategist for Sector Economics and Development Impact, responsible for um, the International Finance Corporation's Global Sustainability Strategy, uh, and her work includes diagnostics of and uh, solutions for environmental and social challenges to private sector growth in emerg emerging markets. And then we have Simon Zadek, who is Chair of the Finance for Biodiversity Initiative and Director of Migrant Nation. He leads a campaign to get biodiversity impacts incorporated into financial decision making, and he's co-chair of the technical work of the Relatively New Task Force on Nature related financial disclosures, which we'll call TNFD for short. And then we have Ivo Molda, who leads the UN Environment Programme's Climate Finance Unit. That brings together various initiatives and finance facilities that actively unlock public and private capital towards sustainable land use with positive impacts to the climate, nature and people. And last but very not least, because he's going to be starting uh, the event today, we have Anil Markandian, uh, who is the Distinguished ECOBAS Professor at the Basque Centre for Climate Change, uh, which is also known as BC3. He was a lead author for chapters of the third and fourth IPCC assessment reports on climate change, which were awarded a share of the Nobel Prize in 2007. And today, Anil is going to be presenting his latest research on the natural capital financing gap for meeting the SDGs. So over to you, Anil. Thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, we can. Yeah, good. We can hear you. Well, thank, thank you, Megan, and uh, let, let me get started then. So, um, I'm going to talk about uh, some work we have been doing with uh, GGKP on, on two, uh, two related issues. One is the financial needs uh, to meet the SDGs, where the SDGs that we're looking at are those where, with a significant natural capital involvement or natural capital component. Uh, and the other part of the work which we've been doing that looks at the increase in natural capital that is achieved if those SDGs are met. So these two pieces of work have been going side by side. Uh, most of what I will talk about today is the 
costs or the financial outlays needed to meet the SDGs for the, these particular, the, the SDGs particularly closely tied to a natural capital. Um, next slide, please. So as we say, uh, what we've been doing is to estimate the gap in natural capital, we first studied the made an estimate of the costs of increasing natural capital to achieve related SDGs. Um, and this study was prepared um, under the guidance of the Natural Capital Expert Group, GGKP. It identifies uh, where the key knowledge, uh, key knowledge gap which exists in the provision of natural capital data, which is the number of people involved in and on the panel will be interested to use because it, it will inform national, national green growth actions and policies. And next slide, please. So a kind of single figure that sums the, our estimate of the gap is that we would need something of the order of 707 billion a year to uh, in, in investment to uh, address the uh, natural to meet the SDGs in the natural capital related or uh, related areas, and these include um, uh, investments in land remediation, improvements in air and water. Uh, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, and as, as important or more importantly, in some cases, conserving or strengthening natural ecosystems. And there are a number of uh, targets related to that. Now, the, you will see that our, uh, our coverage of the SDGs is not just on what is normally con or conventionally considered as uh, in the environment of ecosystems, but we go wider, we include air and water. We also include uh, greenhouse gas emissions because they are relevant to our, uh, our an assessment of our natural capital. Uh, next slide, please. So this slide may be a little bit difficult to see, but here we're giving you the data. We, what we did was made a, an assessment for 10 uh, countries who were kind of selected to, to give an, an example of the kind of data we would get at the country level. And then we made an assessment as well at the global level. Um, and the categories which we included were agricultural land remediation, water and sanitation, climate change, air pollution, material efficiency. So we use less uh, materials per unit of output. Um, deforestation to uh, prevent deforestation, to con conserve or to re uh, rehabilitate wetlands, uh, increase protected areas. And then there's a figure for the sum of all of these. The amounts are not precise. There are still a lot of difficulties in getting the numbers exact, but the, the table gives you an idea of the orders of magnitude involved. And you can see that uh, while uh, greenhouse gas or climate change is important, which accounts for maybe about a third, the other categories also uh, would have significant financial needs. Which need to, which have to be addressed, and we can't just uh, focus on what we normally think of as, as uh, uh, what we normally uh, ha we have recently been focusing a lot on, which is climate change. Uh, we then have the countries we looked at in some detail. We selected uh, three from Africa: Senegal, uh, Uganda, and Madagascar. Uh, we selected India and Indonesia from Asia, uh, India, Indonesia, and China, sorry, Morocco from North Africa, and then Brazil uh, from uh, Latin America, and then two uh, uh, more developed countries, uh, Australia and the USA. In some cases, uh, some, some countries 
they do not need uh, to make investments in some under some categories because their their uh, SDG targets for those those uh, categories are already met. Next slide, please. So uh, where do we we also then went on to compare these costs with the increases in natural capital which they will bring about. And that work is uh, in, in a in accompanying report, which has just been completed, has not yet been released. But here we find that the increases in natural capital are almost always a sig many times greater than the amount of uh, financial uh, outlay that you need to make. Uh, the, but the one which is perhaps the most outstanding, the biggest, is that for every dollar in land remedi uh, remediation, or uh, in the case in in wetland restoration, you get a $391 increase in the value of natural capital in that form. Uh, this is this is the, the if you like the largest, the most outstanding figure, but you also have very high uh, in increases in natural capital per dollar. Uh, financial outlay for many for all for all the other areas, uh, and in case of land remediation, uh, the increases are particularly large in 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 countries on uh, in developing countries and particularly in countries in the African continent. Next slide, please. Um, then the same report also gives you an idea of the amount of. Uh, the finance you need for the different uh, um, SDGs in different countries. And these little rings here just show you that it's not the same in all countries. So in some, like uh, agriculture and land remediation, for example, is, it takes up the bulk in, in, in a country like Madagascar, Morocco, uh, whereas in others um, it... Uh, um, in, uh, in the more developed countries, it's reductions in greenhouse gases and air pollution, uh, or uh, which, uh, which are the dominant costs. And the same China in this context is much closer to the, the picture in Australia and the USA than, than it is to that of the, the, uh, some of the more developing countries. So this kind of information uh, to help uh, will also help to determine where the resources need to go and maybe to help uh, in terms of funding priorities. And so what are the next steps uh, for policymakers? Well, we need to compare one, the estimates of the required finance against the rate of actual investment to see where uh, the the real financing gaps lie. We were not able to do that because we just did not have enough information on the amounts that were currently being sp uh, spent in, in the individual countries in these different categories. Um, so that collecting that would be would be a, a next step forward. And then we have, uh, I, to identify actions that can accelerate the mobilization of finance where the gap is greatest and where the need for meeting the SDGs has the greatest priority. And um, the other speakers uh, who have uh, been working on this on these issues will, of course, uh, provide excellent uh, support to this. So these are some of the coming reports uh, which uh, on closing the natural capital financing gap, I, please keep uh, uh, your uh, look out for, the, for, their, for when they are likely to be released. This fall, we've got an updated study, which I gave you some information from on the uh, financing needs for 20 countries, as well as the increases in natural capital that will be achieved. Then in, in the winter of uh, this year, we are going to have a more Comprehensive African Regional Gaps Reports on Natural Capital. And then in the spring of next year, we hope to have a global gaps report on natural capital, natural capital and the SDGs. 
So I stop here and uh, thank you for your attention. Please do read the uh, full report and get in touch. Uh, and the fact sheets are there. The, the copy of the report is there. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed, Anil. That was really fascinating um, and very important information. I do a lot of work on climate finance um, and I feel as if there's a lot more information and data um, that's available for climate finance in particular as opposed to finance for um, natural protection. And uh, it's interesting to hear you highlighting some of the gaps and some of the very interesting aspects, such as the fact that, you know, investing in wetlands restoration can, can bring such a, a high return. So I look forward to uh, reading uh, those reports that are coming up. And um, now we'll go to Yanis, um, who's going to give us a response to um, Anna's report and to the presentation. Um, and as the former um, European Commissioner for the Environment and co-chair of the International uh, Resources Panel, Yanis is going to um, give us also some information about a, a new IRP report uh, called Building Biodiversity and speak to us um, in that context. Thank you, Yanis. Thank you, Megan. And thank you for the invitation to speak on this important topic. Together with uh, Isabella Teixeira, I co-chair the IRP, International Resource Panel. It's a science policy interface hosted by UNEP since 2007, analyzing trends and impacts of natural resource use, possible scenarios needed for its future, and policies linked to them. Why is looking at natural resource use such a useful lens in understanding underlying causes of the many challenges we face? Natural resources are the bridge connecting drivers and pressures to the impacts and consequences. Natural resources are the basis for our whole economy and life. And at the same time, their use is the cause of all environmental impacts that are also threatening our health. In short, they are connecting everything. The IRP tells us that only the extraction and processing of natural resource materials, including metals, minerals, fossil fuels, and biomass, causes 50% of global climate change, over 80% of water stress, as well as one third of global air pollution. A staggering 80% of global land related biodiversity loss is caused by resource extraction and processing of only biomass. That is why with Isabella, we decided to contribute an opinion piece titled Building Biodiversity, explaining how managing the root drivers of nature loss, our use of natural resources can halt and even reverse biodiversity loss. It looks at biodiversity governance through a natural resource use lens and highlights principles which policymakers can put into practice for effective implementation of the next set of global biodiversity targets. The CBD COP15 later in the year will set these targets. Natural resource management principles need to be part of their implementation. The principles can also guide biodiversity finance and assure natural assets have the best impact possible. These principles are, first, know your true impact. A science-based participatory value chain approach based on material flow and impact footprint data provides transparency on biodiversity use and impacts across sectors and lifestyles. This transparency can be used to design policies that incentivize demand for resource efficient, low footprint products. Second, plan together. Integrated special landscape planning assesses natural resource demand across ministries, sectors, and stakeholders, and with high level political support optimizes integrated policy, maker, policy making for biodiversity governance. Third, grow with nature. We need to design economic, urban, agricultural, and other policies to incentivize nature-based solutions and transitioning to a circular bioeconomy that leverages natural ecosystem services while halting and reversing biodiversity loss. And finally, fourth, value nature. 
we should recognize and account for the role nature plays in our world and enable the economic systems to recognize nature's benefits to allow investments, for example, payments for ecosystem services. Governance of natural capital valuation requires clear international standards and also careful regulation. Now you will be rightly asking, how can this help finance to be more effective? To find out how they can help, we need to look at existing finance for biodiversity and Anil highlighted the huge financing gap we need to close to meet the nature-related SDGs. At the moment, financial flows towards nature are small. Every year, government money spent on activities likely to damage nature is more than five times greater than spending which supports nature coming from public and private actors combined. And Anil also pointed out investment is urgent. The Dasgupta Review estimated that delaying action and investment by 10 years would more than double the cost of halting biodiversity loss by 2050. Practically, delaying makes the scale of action so huge that it would be probably unachievable. At the moment, the majority of finance going to biodiversity is spent by governments on conservation efforts in their own countries. It is great that some money is going towards these conservation efforts, but there is potential for these investments to be even more effective. To assure the biggest impact possible, it would need to be directed by science-based integrated spatial planning, capturing the total picture of biodiversity hotspots and human demands on natural resources from land and sea. How are these resources being used? And how do their uses impact each other? If there's no integrated strategy, there is no guarantee investment is being channeled to where it could have the best impact for nature and people. By having the strategy enables investors and policymakers to conserve nature and achieve other benefits from the same space. Looking at all demands together highlights trade-offs and win-wins. And an example, marine protected areas increase fish populations for nearby fisheries and at the same time provide jobs in sustainable tourism. IRP have analyzed over 350 integrated spatial planning initiatives from around the world. Most of them have positive impacts on agriculture, nature, and also on livelihoods. As well as supporting mentioned conservation efforts, finance for natural capital can support nature positive production. Science-based value chain transparency is essential here. At the moment, value chains relying on nature are not properly accounting for their impacts. The need for greater transparency is already recognized in the green finance community. It is already driving investment, encouraging financial actors to invest in companies, reducing their impact or even enhancing nature. Policymakers need to make strong science-based value chain transparency a reality through investing in data and verification and working on consistent international standards. They could, for example, be based on IRP's impact footprint methodology. Funds can also be channeled towards business models which grow value by producing natural materials and enhancing ecosystem services at the same time. These production practices avoid landscape degradation, minimize waste, and help ecosystem function. Take an example, planting bamboo to support poverty alleviation. It is so fast growing and easy to harvest that it can restore degraded landscapes while providing livelihoods through production simultaneously. In Tanzania, it has created an important number of jobs and brought extra income to communities. There could be much greater investment in these nature-based and circular solutions which deliver for climate as well as for nature and people. Only 3% of global climate finance goes towards nature-based solutions, despite their high cost effectiveness compared to other solutions. Planning better, value chain transparency and investing in nature-based solutions can all make a great difference. But what is ultimately needed is fundamental shift in economic and financial systems. They need to account for nature's true value. The systems currently do not recognize the value of natural assets and the services they provide and are not incentivizing actors to the use of finite resources sustainably. 
We should stop giving producers the signals that destroying natural capital is free of charge. And we should stop confusing consumers by asking them to behave responsibly, but requesting to pay more if they do so. I would be first claiming that nature has intrinsic value we must respect and protect. But until, as nicely put it by Professor Stiglitz, invisible hand will often be invisible since it's not there, or this is in the very words of the famous Finnish writer Eko Arto Pasalina, a charming mass suicide orchestrated by the invisible hand of markets. Nature needs to be integrated into economic decision making. This does not just mean putting a price on nature. The Dasgupta Review recommends grounding economic decision making on an inclusive measure of wealth based on human produced and natural capital. This incorporates ecosystem extent and quality into central policy making and sends strong market signals. Payments for ecosystem services schemes are one way actors can be rewarded for protected and enhancing natural capital. An example is the Arguaia leak in Mato Grosso in Brazil. It financially compensates sustainable producers who support conservation and reduce their GAG emissions. There is a growing acknowledgement that economic activity impacts nature, but also depends on it. The task force on nature related financial disclosures has just been launched. It aims to guide organizations to report and act on nature related risks, supporting a shift towards nature positive financial flows. By using the principles outlined in our Building Biodiversity piece, investment in natural capital can be channeled as effectively as possible. We must change how industries, governments, and societies are incentivized to use natural resources and acknowledge that economic activities fundamentally rely on nature and are not external to it. To conclude, for the beginning, it would be good to acknowledge that we humans are part of nature and start behaving accordingly. What would this mean in policy terms? Redefining consumption from owing to using. Redefining production from mass sales to providing efficient functionalities, needs. Redefining core economic incentives such as taxation and subsidies. It would also mean making integrated well-being the objective across all policies, measuring sustainability with a life cycle perspective, looking at innovation in categories of economic ecosystems that provide societal functions rather than in categories of production sectors. And of course, it would mean investing in natural capital to achieve all SDGs. Acknowledging the true value of natural capital would almost inevitably at least in the short term, lead to some price increases and worsen the already unenviable social situation. Unacceptable for many already today living on the edge. Environmental and social transformations are closely interlinked. And without simultaneously addressing all the SDG spectrum and integrating into our joint efforts more equitable and just distribution of wealth created we have limited chance to succeed. Dear friends, there is already a high level of agreement that the transition to a more sustainable society and economy is unavoidable. But ultimately, it will be about speed and scale of that transition. It will be about addressing the drivers and pressures that cause the challenges we are facing, about providing systemic perspective to guide decision-making, and about channeling sufficient investments to support that transition. To remain credible, countries with the highest consumption footprint and most transpassing planetary boundaries must lead by example. We are in the race against time, and it is high time for us humans to prove that we are as intelligent as we claim. Thank you, and I look forward to your comments and questions. Back to you, Megan. Thank you very much, Giannis. Will we indeed prove that we're as intelligent as we claim? I don't know. I think uh, the next few years uh, will be absolutely key um, in determining that. 
and the outcomes um, of the big climate and, and biodiversity conferences this year will definitely um, have a huge influence on that. And I'm taking away from your <clears throat> response to Anil's presentation uh, the fact that you know there really is a large gap uh, that needs to be filled when it comes to both changing um, the way that we run our economies and also in terms of channeling the hundreds of billions um, of dollars a year in finance that are needed uh, to, to look after nature better. And also the urgency uh, of this. I mean, we hear it a lot in the climate change space um, because we have targets for 2030 um, and we know what we've got to do um, by mid-century, but I think perhaps the urgency of acting um, in the biodiversity and nature uh, space has not been perhaps emphasised to, to the same extent that we're hearing on, on climate change. And one thing that struck me was this need for a more holistic and joined up view, um, which is something that comes together in the sustainable development goals. But as we know, there's been for a long time quite a divide between people working on, on biodiversity and people working on climate change. And it was interesting to see the two intergovernmental panels coming together recently um, with all their scientists um, in a big briefing for media where they really were uh, insisting that um, the issues need to be tackled together um, and not separately. For example, if we don't do that, we could see uh, problems arising where certain minerals um, and natural resources that are needed for the green transition are extracted and exploited in a way that, that is detrimental to nature and that, that just cannot really be allowed to happen and should not be allowed to happen based, based on what we know already. Thank you very much indeed, Yanis. Um, we're going to move to our, um, we're going to move to our panel discussion now with our, our three guests. Um, and I just wanted to say that if you have uh, questions for the panelists, please do put them in the question box or in the chat. And if you want to tweet um, from this event, uh, you've seen the hashtag earlier, I think it's hashtag GGKP webinar. So I'll bring in our three panelists now, but if you also have questions for Anna and Yanez, you can, you can put those in the chat and we'll try and uh, get those questions to them as well at the end. So uh, now we have Elizabeth White uh, from the International Finance Corporation, uh, Simon Zadek, who is Chair of the Finance uh, for Biodiversity Initiative, and Eva Mulder from uh, the United Nations Environment Programme in charge of the Climate Finance Unit. So, Elizabeth, we'll bring you in first. Um, obviously, with this huge gap that exists in terms of funding and financing, uh, the private sector is going to have to play a very important role in achieving the SDGs uh, as they relate to natural capital. What ways do you see that the private sector can play its part? Um, and do you think that the principles Yanez was talking about would resonate with the private sector? We do hear companies nowadays talking about being forest positive, nature positive, and talking about regenerative agriculture. I'm just wondering if you could share lessons from your own experience of, of working with the private sector. Yeah, thank you very much. And I, I'd like to thank Andrew and the organizers for inviting me to join today. It was very interesting, the two presentations. I, I appreciated them very much. And I think when we think about the private sector's contribution to natural capital, there may be four ways. Um, the one we comes to mind first, which is how can we mobilize innovation and products and finance that can support this transition to circularity or GHG emissions reduction or biodiversity protection? And as Jan has noted, we're seeing an increase in these sustainability-oriented bonds or loans in emerging markets. For instance, global thematic fixed income markets reached 700 billion in 2020, nearly doubling what it was in 2019. So there is an opportunity for us to try to capture some of that space and bring these innovative instruments um, to scale so that we, that we can start to see some of this transition. The second is to build on the base of better risk management moving not only from a do no harm approach, but one that recognizes that there's value delivered through ESG standards that are material. So it's not just about protecting the negative, not polluting, but it's also about reaching towards the positive with these standards. And how we can integrate natural capital thinking into those risk management approaches, I think could give us a way to mainstream the private sector's uh, contribution. 
The third is bringing the voice and examples of leaders who are out there doing this work to demonstrate to the market the case for sustainability and how they can use the value of nature and conversations to with a, right alongside return on investment, much as Anil did in demonstrating what that can be at a country level, how can we bring that into boardrooms so that the discussion is also about how decisions are made based on this information. And then finally, I was struck by Janice's mentioning payment for ecosystem services and thinking about some of the innovative models that we've seen in small landscapes, like in El Nido in the Philippines. How can we cap tourism at coral reefs at the same times that we don't hurt the livelihood of the small tour operators? And I think we need to think about that. And maybe it's payment for ecosystem services, insurance, but, but there's a whole lot of different tools that we have um, where we can leverage these smaller returns. We tend to think big, we also need to think um, to think small. I don't wanna to take too much more time, but you did ask a quick question about the principles. And I think the principles that, that he um, outlined are 100% where we think that the leaders in the industry are going in terms of natural capital. So ensuring risk management approaches look across the whole value chain, upstream and downstream, and include those in decision-making is spot on with what, what uh, he mentioned. Janice mentioned. The second, finding these opportunities to protect natural assets on which business depend by working together at a landscape level, the El Nido example, for instance, and then valuing the benefits of nature so that we have the business case for what, what it will take and making sure that we follow this pathway for transition. It's not going to happen immediately. So how can we make sure that we're pulling not only the, the reduction in negatives, but the underscoring the positive. So I think the, the principles are very much where we see the uh, space going. Thank you. Great, thanks Elizabeth. And I'm just wondering if you could tell us in practical terms a little bit more about the work that you're doing to um, <clears throat> ensure that some of these investments and um, ways of thinking are, are implemented on the ground. Sure. So we've worked a lot with the Natural Capital Coalition, now the Capitals Coalition, to come up with the Natural Capital Protocol and to work with different uh, in, um, industry leaders, Olam, for instance, or AXA in the insurance industry, or some of some in the banking sector, to see how does this work, what's fit for purpose, and what are the challenges that they have uh, to implementing it. So, for instance, one channel challenge is clearly data. It's very difficult to get data for a company, especially at the landscape level, of their effects on ecosystem services. And even the natural capital accounts that we have are often too high. Um, so how can we bring that down to a, a, a geographic area where a business might be operating so that businesses can start to have the tools that they need? Capitals Coalition is doing a lot in that regard. At IFC, we're working a lot with the uh, ICMA green bond principles, thinking of how do we do a blue bond for business? How do we make that attractive and build capacity of uh, the financial institutions as well as the others on the ground? And the third is we're thinking about markets. How do you take experience and replicate what one actor's doing? How do we have to happen to influence the enabling environment so that we can shift the dynamics in that market? What does that mean on the ground for capacity for certification, for instance? and for these types of innovative financial instruments. So at least when we look at our investments, we look at two pieces. One is what is the, the impact from a negative and positive point of view? And the second is can we use and leverage our experience to shift others in the market to adopt these natural capital approaches? A contribution from the birds in the background. Um, <clears throat> to have a little bit of nature coming into our webinar today. We can hear them in those trees behind you, which is lovely. Um, Simon, I'll bring you in at this point. Um, you're working, um, you know, directly with uh, the the financial sector, also on the new task force on the nature-related financial disclosure. And so, I'm just wondering if you could fill us in a little bit on uh, some of the practical ideas that are that are floating up now about how to uh, put some of this into the broader system and make it apply across the board. And how do you change how private capital deals uh, with nature and investments uh, in things like food with 
uh, governance systems like, like a task force? How, how is that going to work going forward? Thanks, Megan. And also thanks to GGKP for organizing this. I think it's very timely as we begin to see finally uh, nature surge, uh, particularly in at least debate about uh, the nexus with finance. And, and I think we can take you know, many lessons from the climate agenda, but perhaps one that is of central importance, uh, which is that in the early years of thinking about climate and finance, we thought about climate finance. Yeah, and at some point we stopped thinking about climate finance as we realized that really what we needed to think about was how to align global finance with climate goals, not how to mobilize finance for climate. Now, these are not entirely exclusive agendas, but I think it is reasonable to apply the same lens in the nature space. That yes, we can see occasions where we need to mobilize finance, particularly public finance, in order to invest in nature outcomes that the market won't provide. But, but actually what we're trying to do at scale is to align global finance with nature positive outcomes. Uh, and that has less to do with mobilization and more to do with changing the rules of the game. Now TNFD is perhaps the foundational piece that needs to shift some of the core rules of the game as it relates particularly to the private sector, to private finance, in that it is driving effectively the same agenda, albeit with different challenges that TCFD has driven climate forward with in framing risk, in driving disclosure, and effectively in placing nature risk upside and downside, as Elizabeth says, more centrally in the way in which assets are priced and financing decisions are made. That is a a global agenda, particularly for financial and capital markets, but is not irrelevant for public finance, given the interlinkages between public and private finance. Secondly, we need to understand that, that ODA and bits of cash that are floating around in the international cooperation space are exactly that, just bits of cash. You know, global GDP and global expenditure in particular comprises something like 25 to 28% public expenditure. It's a huge volume of money out of an $80 trillion global GDP. Uh, our work, which focused particularly in the last two years on the nature content of the stimulus programs announced in the course of the pandemic, you know, showed very clearly uh, how extensively nature was being ignored, also a point that Anil has made. And a recent report more specifically focused on the European Commission's national uh, recovery program, post-pandemic recovery program, suggests you know, nature positive outcomes amount to about two cents in the euro of the 800 plus billion euro that are being allocated for that program. You know, I could go on with the data, but the facts are clear, which is that we need to align public finance at scale, not only ODA or other funds that course their way through international cooperation, and we need to align global private finance, uh, which is you know, of a magnitude of the order of $400 trillion of assets under management. Now, obviously, not every dollar under management has the same relationship with nature, hence your point about food. And, and so I wanted just to make a couple of comments about food and then pass it back to you, Megan, realizing we have a short time left. So the food system is about an $8 trillion system. So about 10% of global GDP. And the World Bank and other estimates offer externality predictions or projections of anything between 8 trillion to 19 trillion, in fact, in the case of follow and systemic in recent work. So many times in some cases, the value of actual financialized uh, financialized transactions. And a significant portion of those externalities are clearly nature related, others being climate, uh, health, nutrition outcomes, and so on. A and so clearly, yes, we need to think about how to invest money 
in rewilding or regenerative agriculture, but ultimately we need to pass rules of the game, whether they be financial regulation, whether they concern litigation, as we've seen in the courts in relation to climate, or whether they concern the nudging of consumer behavior in ways that shift those externalities from externalities to internalized processes. And I'll just conclude with a simple example for the Netherlands. Uh, in today's press in the Netherlands, I'm sitting in Amsterdam today, is a very interesting piece uh, that says that if the laws are passed in the Netherlands that force changes in the way in which additives to agriculture are used and nitrogen runoff is allowed, then major parts of the Dutch agricultural system, remember the second largest food exporter in the world, will become uneconomic. Yeah, this is today uh, in the Dutch press. And, and so we can see the level of transformation that is really going to happen as we begin to shift financial resources away from nature destructive assets and production towards nature positive assets and production. Thanks very much. Absolutely, Simon. That's a great example um, to finish on there. And Ivo, I wanted to bring you in here because, you know, talking about agriculture and food and commodities, um, this is very much um, an area I think that you, you've worked on in terms of nature-based pollution and forests and um, how uh, finance is reoriented in order to align far better um, with the protection of forests and nature. Um, how do you see that being done in a more effective way than it is at the moment? Because it's very much, you know, the discussion nowadays is about carbon offsets and how do we use that money to protect forests? And there's a lot of kind of controversy around those. Um, and perhaps it's more a case of doing what Simon's just been talking about and just shifting the way the whole uh, economic system works in order to ensure that we don't need to compensate so much for the damage that's done or prevented, that instead we are we're actually uh, valuing everything as we go along so as not to harm it in the first place. Yeah, thanks, uh, Megan. <clears throat> Just want to double check if you can hear me. But um, yeah, building on what Simon okay. and Elizabeth, um, I think the enabling environment is critical. Um, just a few months ago, Switzerland agreed a, a bilateral trade agreement with Indonesia, and and one element of it included a provision to reduce um, trade-related tariffs for for palm oil that was produced sustainably. So it's a it's a clear incentive for, say, in this case, Indonesian producers knowing that they have a market and that that also is rewarded with an, with an economic incentive. Um, I mean, Janos can probably speak better to, to than me, but they also agreed on a new um, budget uh, for, 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 say, agriculture, which is sort of sucking up most, most of the um, uh, funding that, that the EU is spending. Um, and, and I think more than previously, the amount of, of, of capital that will be dependent on nature-related outcomes has, has basically increased. So you, you do need to actually provide the incentives for farmers, you have to provide the incentives for consumers to actually change. And I think it's, it's starting to happen in some places, so that's one. Um, second, yes, we have been trying to pioneer uh, also a number of, of so-called blended finance uh, mechanisms with Rabobank, for example, on the agri free funds, uh, with Engreen and others. And, and um, the reason why some of these deals have happened is because a bank like Rabobank has made a commitment and has put uh, targets on the commercial teams, which is very uncommon um, for commercial banks to say part of your bonuses will be dependent on the ability for you to make deals with your clients in Brazil or Indonesia, for example. So they are really sticking their neck out. If we want to come to get to scale, then the peers will have to do the same thing. Um, if you look at impact investors, there are a number of impact investors like um, uh, Mirova Natural Capital, um, Eco Business Fund and others. They've been raising money from DFIs and from high net worth individuals, but the big um, elephant in the room is institutional investors. And so far they've, they've stood on the sidelines because the risk is too high or the ticket size is too small. And again, I think we need to see what sort of blended finance uh, options are possible to uh, tap into money from pension funds and insurance companies. Um, so, so these are some, some examples that um, 
I think are needed. And then I would hope that the likes of IFC and others are able to scale up where, uh, say, the small pioneering initiatives that that, uh, that UNEF has been involved in um, would then sort of take it to the next level. Uh, Simon, I mean, you you yourself are also involved uh, um, in, in this very interesting innovation with, say, nature-linked sovereign debt, so where you basically tie um, interest-related uh, payments to the ability for governments to to meet certain um, nature-related KPIs. So it, I think it is across the financial spectrum where we have to see how to how to bring in positive incentives, whether it's in sovereign bonds, corporate bonds, or in lending. And in many cases, initially, that risk will have to be partly offset by governments because the private sector is just not willing to pay for that full risk, um, nor for the full transaction cost of engaging with clients. Um, but that is, I think, a very important innovation that is uh, needed to happen now. And then we have to think as quickly as possible how to scale it up. Excellent uh, practical examples of some of the um, initiatives that are being taken. And obviously, as you point out, there's a need for those to kind of <clears throat> go across the financial sector in order to be able to achieve a larger scale change. But just to let the audience know that we're going to run a little bit uh, later than the um, expected finish time at the top of the hour. We're going to run uh, for an extra 15 minutes so we can um, get some of your questions uh, to the panel. So we, we've got an interesting question here um, and a very relevant one, I think, which I think it would be good to hear all of your thoughts on briefly. Um, <clears throat> and it's around what I was saying about some of the companies that are now talking about being uh, net nature positive or net biodiversity positive or forest positive. And the question is, are there meaningful and manageable metrics to substantiate such claims? And announcements, which echoes a little bit the conversation that's being had in the climate space around net zero and science-based targets and efforts to ensure, you know, that there isn't greenwashing. Um, maybe I'll go to you first, Ivo. What, what are we seeing in terms of uh, nature when it comes to companies' claims? Are there ways that uh, companies can be held accountable at this point? Yes, it is possible, but um, as, as Elizabeth was saying, the, the, the problem is, is uh, consistent data and metrics. Um, for, for one initiative, the Tropical Landscape Finance Facility, we've developed KPIs, so key performance indicators, which means that the client, in this case, a, a sustainable natural rubber plantation in, um, in Sumatra, will have to uh, report on the extent of forest being protected, including HCV, HES, so high conservation value forest and high carbon stock forest. The amount of, um, oh, sorry, sorry the, the number of, of smallholders that are being provided with jobs, disaggregated by, by gender, and there are other KPIs as well. And the client will have to provide that to the asset manager in this case. What the challenge is, is that uh, first, it will have to be verified by a third party, Megan. Um, and, and second, it's really dependent on the, the quality of the data and the consistency of the data. So I think it's starting to happen, but there, there are costs related to it because uh, people will say, well, if it comes from the, cl from the client, how do we know that we can trust it? So it will have to be third party verified, which adds a cost to it. And then ideally you want to have it standardized as well. So you want to say, let's have five metrics for one for biodiversity, one for climate mitigation, one for climate adaptation, uh, and one for life use, for example. And let's make sure that we, we standardize those across any of the transactions being uh, carried out. And if we couple like a limited number of KPIs with improved data that Elizabeth mentioned, then I do think that the, um, that the market transparency will increase uh, here. Simon here, because obviously the work that you're doing is, is, is uh, very relevant to this, the TNFD. Um, do you see uh, the evolution of a, of a standard that could be applied across, uh, across either countries or co corporate sectors, or how do you see it evolving? Look, you know, in, in the carbon space, you know, a ton is a ton is a ton, yeah? And there are a few challenges to measure it, but we kind of know what we're doing. In, in the nature space, a liter of water is not a liter of water in a different place. It's a different liter of water at a different time of day, at a different season, 
in a different place, used in a different way, owned by somebody different. And so we have to understand that contextual data, spatial location data, yeah, is you know, as important as classic top-down science data measuring the litre. Yeah, so we understand that there is not just a data problem, but there's a different way of thinking about data and performance in context. So Rabobank, for example, would say, we can measure water across much of our portfolio investments, yeah, but to contextualize the meaning of that water is really the big challenge. So, so that's one part of the story. But I think the answer to your question, Megan, is yes, remembering that the question was, can we work with existing data in understanding risks and disclosing them to investors and other stakeholders? The answer is undoubtedly yes. Uh, we, for example, at F4B did an exercise across um, the DFI community, so development finance institution community, uh, largely top down using available data sets, looking at nature at risk uh, and financial risks uh, at the time of the financing commons meeting last November. So 452 DFIs with a combined balance sheet of 11.2 trillion US dollars, you know, and with my sort of hand in my face or vice versa, I would say the answer definitely wasn't right, but the answer was definitely useful. Yeah, and we can really use the existing data sets we've got to move forward, understanding that those will improve over time. And then I would just conclude with kind of one other point in the TNFD technical scoping paper, um, uh, we make a point of emphasizing sort of this nature of a, data, of a data stack, where you have, if you like, the scientific data, the liter of water, yeah, or it could be many other things, and then a sort of stack of different data contextualizing it in more and more depth, you know, which might come down to the impact on indigenous communities in a particular place or human rights issues as well, not only nature outcomes. Uh, and as long as we understand the quality of the data stack that we have, we can work even with fairly shallow versions of the stack without making claims that are inappropriate. Right, so we're basically looking at a fairly complex uh, task <laughs> that's being faced here and perhaps even more so than when it comes to climate change mitigation just because of the very wide range of things that may need to be measured and also the fact that as you say it doesn't mean the same in one place as it might mean in another. Elizabeth, can I bring you in on this question please? What's your perspective uh, from IFC on, on how this can be measured, the metrics? Yeah, I think Evo and Simon uh, mentioned a lot of really good points. I, I would just add that as we start to see businesses all want to be more impact driven and in addition to risk management driven, we see a need to develop some models that can help, to help us estimate and capture that contextual nuance with, along with what a proxy would give us. So why am I saying that? Um, measuring how much water is used and how much we have been able to save is something that any company can do as part of its ENS risk management process. It could be a standard that, that can be standardized across different systems, measured, verified, et cetera. Translating that into the value that Simon mentioned is much more difficult. So we're faced with this when we're doing our impact investing principles at IFC. We want to be able to translate that into what does that mean for society, for nature, that you saved X many milliliters of water. Um, and we just don't have the data or the models that can give us that level of comfort. I think that we need to not be too um, purist when we look at data in, in, in where we want to go and say, okay, it's not perfect, but it's the best we have now. As we increase and improve our spatial information, our ability to use satellite systems to estimate water, et cetera, um, in different contexts, we'll be able to do it much better. We have the operating principles for impact investing at IFC targeting the real sector as well as the financial sector. And those are the types of questions is what's your negative? How do you measure it? How do you certify it? How do you verify it? But what's your potential positive? And, and that potential positive is where I see we could bring the science-based targets, all of the, the great work that's being done in the public sector space 
to help us develop these types of models that we could rely on to capture the full benefits. Right, so there's still quite a lot of work to be done uh, by the sounds of it. And Anil, um, I don't know if he's still with us, um, is obviously uh, embarking on uh, some of this work. Um, and John uh, Morn, who gave the introduction uh, earlier, um, made a point which is that there are issues with valuation um, but there are also strengths and one of them is that a dollar is a dollar is a dollar um, <laughs> so Anna, you've been doing this work to to sort of compare um, what's needed in in different ecosystems and what would you be your thoughts on this question of the metrics and how one can compare across different countries or, or sectors or companies indeed well, we've been making a, a big effort on it, and I think we now are drawing on a base of uh, valuation studies, uh, which is uh, which is impressive. Uh, it, it, uh, Simon's point is right that, of course, if you want quantitative indicators of performance, um, it is difficult to to to, to set them out for uh, many many ecosystems because. Uh, the, um, if you like, the the impact of uh, changes in the quantities in physical terms are very site specific, uh, but that's not to say that the uh, it's it's impossible to value them, and uh, what we have tried to do is get some of these values to tr to try and then use them to to get to construct a a measure of the 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 natural capital that they that they that they represent and they provide and uh, again that's building quite a lot on work that uh, uh, that das Gupta also has been involved with in the inclusive wealth studies and the world bank has done quite a lot most recently on uh, comprehensive wealth so we we are drawing now on a on a base which is which is growing and, and, and which can be used to, to try and get these values, which uh, the question is, is it possible in any way to securitize them so that we can get the private sector involved in, um, in, in uh, purchasing or in investing in them? And that, that many of the questions your panelists have answered, addressed and talked about raise some very interesting and intriguing aspects of that, that 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 question. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Anil. Simon, I wanted to bring you in. Uh, you've got you you're indicating that you, you've got something to add. But also can I ask you to address the question from the audience briefly, which is about this issue of the need to reduce and remove harmful subsidies. Um, you know, the, the funding that actually uh, causes natural capital uh, and biodiversity to, to deteriorate and be degraded right. because this is something that is often raised actually. Okay, so I'll, I'll say the thing I was going to do really quickly and then um, and then come to the question. So I wanted just to sort of connect a comment made by Evo with a comment made by Anil. You know, Evo mentioned the work that's going on in the uh, sovereign debt space. Um, that FOB, the World Bank, many others are involved in now in trying to figure how to bring natural capital into mainstream risk pricing uh, in sovereign debt markets rather than relying on these exotic one-off nature debt swaps. Um, what's clear is that if we took an approach um, that required us to develop large-scale, harmonized, standardized data sets, we would never ever get to issue a bond, let alone trade anything. Um, and so actually what we have to do is start with what we've got. So if Pakistan has announced that it wants to do a nature performance bond, you know, then we figure out with them, you know, what a sort of tradable, quantifiable, data-driven approach to measuring nature performance outcomes might be and what that might be worth to the creditor. Uh, and if we're working with um, uh, sovereign credit rating, so with rating agencies, which FOB is, in looking at what nature fits in, you know, one can't go for a large scale complete model. One has to really begin to pick out the pieces that seem most relevant. So I'm, you know, all in favor of a sort of 
English pragmatism type approach, if I might say so, in kind of developing practice uh, where we have limited data sets in order to get stuff moving. Uh, and I think that um, my guess is we all agree with that. You know, and the standardization will emerge from that process and shouldn't impede our progress. And, and then on the point of subsidies, you know, we're back into this subsidy game again, right? You know, so, you know, the IMF reckons it back in 2015 that there were $5.3 trillion a year in carbon related subsidies linked to the carbon intensive energy systems, $5.3 trillion a year. Never mind how they work that out. We can come back to that some other time. And actually, the truth is, is that nobody stopped the subsidies. It's just they're becoming less relevant. Yeah, that, that despite 20 years of campaigning against fossil fuel subsidies, actually the campaigning hasn't made that much difference. I hate to say what's really made a difference has been the technology learning curve in solar and wind. Um, and so we have to ask the question, are there equivalents in the nature space you know, where we have similarly a $700 billion you know, agricultural subsidy story that's largely going to large scale industrialized nature and climate polluting food companies. Um, so is there an equivalent to, to solar and wind that is not going to sweep subsidies away, but is just going to make them less relevant? You know, for example, vertical farming and alternate protein models, you know, is that, is that our equivalent in the nature space of a major technology disruption that'll just make those subsidies not so important? Or is it really going to be much more focused on a political economy solution yeah where we actually have to go up against the incumbents that are receiving those subsidies which we've seen in the energy space in practice is a really really difficult thing to achieve yes indeed i would, I would agree with that um we've seen a lot of advocacy around these subsidies but they are shifting <laughs> very slowly um indeed so yes what what is the alternative um the, the equivalent of renewable energy technology for, for the nature space very good question simon one we'll try and think about as well so i've got one more question for ivo um which uh, i will put to ivo and then we're going to round up and um just to finish off i'd like all of our panelists and well all of our speakers including Yanis and anna if they can just to give one thought about what would be the most thing to come out of the COP15 um, biodiversity meeting, um, the one thing that should be included um, in the new global um, biodiversity framework in order to get the finance flowing in the right direction for nature. So before we go to that, um, Ivo, the question for you is, why do private investors need the public sector to cover the risks and transaction costs for um, their investments, positive investments in, in nature? And is there a risk that they will then never um, be weaned off that subsidy if indeed they, they get it? Sorry, Megan, can you repeat the question? I wasn't completely clear. Yes, yeah, sorry. Why do private investors need the public sector to cover off risks? Uh, for them and transaction costs in order to attract more investment to, to nature-based solutions. Okay, yeah, so, so to, to give an example, like if you talk about palm oil, which is a, a commodity that we use on a daily basis, um, the, the default model is that we convert uh, tropical forests in, in Malaysia, Indonesia or other places and, and those palm oil plantations have a lifespan of about 20 years and after 20 years or before the 20 years is over, more force is going to be destroyed to make way for more palm oil plantations. So if you want a different model, if you want to have a sustainable palm oil plantation, for example, in this case, you will have to rip out the existing palm trees towards the end of the life cycle and replant them with new ones. The problem here is that the first four years, those, those palm trees do not bear fruit, fruits, which means the farmer does not have an income. So a bank providing a five-year loan and requiring the farmer to pay that loan back in five years, that farm will have a complete inability to do so if you don't have an income for, for, uh, for four years. So the loans required in this case are not for five years, but say for 10 years or, or 12 years. But no bank is willing to extend uh, in, in developing countries a loan or, or, or make a very risky equity investment for, for a period of 10 years. So 
some of that, that credit risk will have to be uh, covered by governments through a guarantee or um, a junior loan or, or otherwise, basically. And that's the reason why, why governments uh, are needed. And you could apply the same thing to yeah, many other commodities uh, around the world, cocoa in, in West Africa, where say smallholders do not have a credit history, um, or uh, soy in Brazil, where pastland recovery has a slightly lower uh, return on investment. So in most cases, you have to, to cover for that extra risk or the slightly um, less predictable revenue flows. Um, so I hope I answered your question. Obviously, that will have to be phased out at some stage. So if it works, you have to see how, how it could become uh, common practice. But then governments do not want to indefinitely subsidize this either. Eh? So um, I think that's, that's what's important. Right. Right, absolutely. Thank you for the practical examples. I think that really helped explain it. So just to go to our last very quick um, response from each of the panelists and the, the two presenters. Um, yes, if you could just give me one thing that you would like to see come out of this year's um, policy process culminating in, in uh, the COP15 in, in Kunming, if it happens as planned, what would you most like to see um, in order to get get the finance flowing for, for nature protection? Either, let's hear from you first. I mean, I think wh why the Paris Agreement was such a powerful one is that it made very specific uh, the one and a half degree into well, the two, to, the two degree target and the one and a half degree preference basically to meet that. And in the Netherlands, where Simon lives, for example, that's been held up in court. So ideally, in Kunming, we would come to and target either like a, a, a percentage of land that's going to be protected or otherwise that is enforceable basically uh, in, in, uh, from, from a national law perspective. Basically. So, so anything that is specific and enforceable. We're hearing a lot about 30 by 30. So um, yes, I know some countries and others are hoping that That's that one. will be one of the targets. Yeah, 30% protection of land and oceans at least by 2030. Um, Simon, let's go to you next. Sure. And then um, I'm going to be rude and jump off because I'm um, a little late for a, 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 another session. So I'll be very quick. So a building, so Ivo's nailed it. Um, so I'll just add a line, which is the importance of the Paris Agreement was that it was possible to build it into transition risk models that allow one to effectively understand physical credit policy and liability risk over longer periods of time that normal definitions of materiality don't allow for. That was really the core of the whole thing. And without that, if we were still doing sort of nanosecond definitions of materiality, we would be nowhere on climate and finance. And so we need to be able to take the GBF, the Global Biodiversity Framework, and translate it into a scenarios-based approach that allows us to do nature transition risk in the same way. That doesn't have to be a unitary currency, i.e. one ton equivalent. It does have to be relatively simple, but the critical point is, is that the financial community has to believe that the policy community will drive towards that outcome, because without that, it can't be used for transition risk modeling. And I thank you very much. I apologize for jumping off preemptively um, and uh, look no, forward to- No, thank you so much, Simon. And sorry for keeping you uh, a little no, bit late totally. there. We really appreciate your insights. Perfect, thank you so much. Um, bye for now, Simon. Um, Elizabeth, I'll, I'll bring you in here. So I think Simon was talking about the equivalent of a well below two degrees C or 1.5 degrees C that's needed. Um, <clears throat> what, what would be on your wish list? Well, my wish list is that we focus on market dynamics and that we see that in order for any of this to matter, we have to get the private sector actors to adopt sustainable practices. That will require not only rules and regulations and the rules of the game, that will require the capacity on the ground so that they can implement it, the right data systems, as well as financial incentives from banks and or from, from governments. Um, and I'm not sure that that's appropriate necessarily for the, uh, the discussions, but it's something that we have to have if we really want to see private sector shift to some more sustainable practices. Excellent. So I guess that means that a lot of business involvement is really required in, in these discussions. As we've seen with climate, that has 
evolved over the years. Perhaps we'll see the same, or we certainly need to by the sounds of it. Anil, I'll come to you. What are you hoping to see from the, the new global uh, uh, Very briefly, I, I, I agree also agree with what uh, Ivo said in, about targets like that, but I also think that there is an important role for the what we have been working on, and that is natural capital. If we can get uh, the value of nature much more clearly in, internalized in 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 decision making, uh, and the best way I think to start with that is to get to give uh, credible and sound values to the services that uh, that biodiversity and ecosystems are providing, and through that. A link the private sector to investing in them and to the, the various channels that have been talked about. So I think that that also has an important role. Thank you. Thank you, Anna, as will your research to be coming out um, in, in the coming months. Janet, um, we'll come back to you um, to, uh, to provide us with the same um, insight, but also any other thoughts that you may have on, on what you've heard this afternoon, which I think has been an extremely rich discussion, and apologies from Elizabeth because she had to run off as well. Over to you, Yanis. Thanks, Megan. Actually, to to, to be frank, uh, I was tempted many times to intervene, uh, especially from the policymakers' perspective, because actually nobody was addressing it from that angle. But it was impossible to unmute anyway. I have forgotten a bit uh, what I wanted to say, but the first thing which I would like to say, and I think it's terribly important, is I think the, the essential thing we need to start uh, thinking about is that we need, um, we, we seriously need to rethink the contemporary economics. So we are, until we will be with all what we do on our markets, incentivizing, maximizing production as we do, instead we would be following uh, meeting human needs, uh, we will have the problem. In, in any resource use, we will have a serious problem. So we don't need car, we need mobility, we don't need a chair, we need to sit, we don't need refrigerator, we need cooled and chilled food and so on. And I can continue and I can continue. You can, with that, you revert incentive to the producer because producer, is forced because suddenly something which is his profit becomes his cost. And if you do that, you actually incentivize the whole economic system in different direction than it's the direction at this very moment. So incentivizing the market signals, changing the market signals is I think essential in that story. And uh, since you have uh, long talked about harmful subsidies and since I was the one who was sitting at the tables where those harmful subsidies were actually discussed and also given. I haven't heard a single politician in my life who would be against removing harmful subsidies, but we have never done it seriously. To, to tell you frankly, harmful subsidies, it's a shame, it's a disgrace, it's a hypocrisy per excellence, and I would never allow any country which is giving more harmful subsidies that, that's actually, on the other hand, supporting the transition to the sustainable economies that it sit at the Paris table. None, because it's hypocrisy. That can't be done, and if we go that way, we will never achieve it. And also arguments that let's not make, let's not focus on, on uh, harmful subsidies, I think are simply not the right arguments. This is sorry public money and public money should be spent for public interest. And public interest is definitely not giving the money to those who are currently destroying the, uh, the courses to uh, more sustainable economies. So I, I simply can't live with that kind of logic because I think it's a false logic. Uh, so to conclude, I think uh, we, need, we, we need seriously to think about dematerialization, about re improving utilization of many things which we are using. And finally, we need to start thinking about difficult things, moving from the resource efficiency to resource sufficiency. Because for the first time in human history, we are the generation which is living 
in the socioeconomic system of planetary scope. We have to manage the planet and our lives. And if we will not do it seriously and together, we will simply fail in our task. Those are very profound and important thoughts to end on, Yanis, and I think they perfectly frame the discussion. We've gone down into some of the details and now we pull back out of the big picture and basically uh, that we really need to be doing things differently and making sure the money um, is used wisely and safely for the planet and for everybody. And on that note, um, I would very much like to thank everybody uh, for joining the webinar today, especially to our great panelists and to our presenters and to GGKP for organizing this event. Um, and GGKP would like me to remind you that today's presentation, as well as the recording of the webinar, will be available shortly at GGKP. Org. Um, you can also visit and join the Green Forum and GGKP's newsletter to stay up to date on sessions like these and get the latest on natural capital tools and research by visiting the website. Once again, thank you so much indeed for a very interesting, rich and fruitful discussion, uh, which I think has been enjoyed very much by all with a lot to think about after this. So thank you very much and goodbye. Thanks, everybody. Bye now.